everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Creature Teachers. My name is Talia and I'm here with Rick Roth of Creature Teachers in Littleton, Mass. And today we're going to learn all about different kinds of carnivores. Okay. What did you bring? Well, today we brought a few different kinds. And the first one <laughs> that we have today is actually a domestic animal. These are ferrets and ferrets, uh, many people have ferrets as pets. Um, ferrets do make wonderful pets. There's a few things about them that you really should need to know before you go out and buy yourself a ferret. Um, first thing is that they are in a group of mammals called mustelids. And mustelids include those things like mink and weasels and skunks. And, skunks. Mm -hmm. and of course skunks smell bad. Some people think that ferrets smell bad. I, I don't smell they it smell at like all. smell like ferrets. Yeah, they, they do smell like ferrets, but it's not <laughs> offensive to me. No, not um, to me To either. some people it is. <laughs> they are notorious for getting into things. If you can see them here, you'll notice that they have a very long body. Uh, this is Gary, and this is Slinky. And they do <laughs> have this very long body, and this is, of course, because they are indeed carnivores, which means they are meat-eating animals. And in their case, they will eat all kinds of small rodents. They will also eat things that are just as big as they are. One of the things that we find with mustelids is that they're very, very aggressive animals and they mm. will go after larger game. Um, they have a long body which allows them to follow things like mice and rats into their burrows. So if a rat would go down there, exactly, mm -hmm. anywhere their head could go, their the tail could follow and they're very <laughs> flexible. They do have a backbone, but because they've got this long body, it allows them to get through things. Now Gary, uh, we call him Gary the Fat Ferret because he is rather portly. Um, and I'm not sure Gary would have as good of a time getting through uh, the crevices and stuff that uh, Slinky here could. But um, they, are, they are wonderful predators. Uh, if we look at their teeth, we can see that they do have these classic canine teeth. Um, this is one of the features we see in, in most of the uh, um, carnivores. Oh. And they uh, are truly carnivores. They don't eat anything in the way of, of um, vegetation or uh, veg vegetables mm -mm. or um, vegetation at all. Um, some other carnivores will. We're going to meet some other ones today that will um, wind up eating uh, um, some vegetable material. But for the most part, when we're talking about carnivores, we are talking about those meat-eating animals. And because they're meat eaters, they do have to kill their prey. So um, a lot of um, times we think of carnivores as being bad uh, animals big, because they do have things. to kill things to eat them. But if we look at them in the big um, scheme of big things, spectrum. we'll notice that they are very important in any ecosystem, in any environment, because they control populations of other animals. And what we see is kind of a balance between the amount of carnivores that are out in the ecosystem and the amount of prey that is out there. Some animals are very specific as to what they eat. Fishers, for instance, will eat a number of different things, and we're finding fishers to be more and more um, animals that are opportunistic. They'll eat whatever they can find. But there was a time when we thought that fishers only ate several things, and one of those things included porcupines. So the fisher porcupine uh, situation is very, very important in a forest because there was a time when porcupine populations got so high that they were eating our forests. And because of that, we had to find out what the problem was. Well, it turns out fishers had been over-trapped for their fur. Once they reintroduced fishers into these places where the porcupine population was so high, porcupine populations fell, and it became very apparent that this carnivore was really, really important for our forest ecosystem. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, what do you think of you two? Mm -hmm. Yep. We have two different types of ferrets here. This is a standard ferret. You'll notice that Gary is quite a bit larger. Um, they should play together. If we put them down here, they might, uh, <laughs> uh, well, again, they're probably more concerned about trying to find out uh, what's going on around them. Hey, yeah. Gary, come on back over here. Now, ferrets <laughs> have been uh, domesticated like this for about 5,000 years, yes, yes? Yes, actually they have. Mm -hmm. and we don't think of that. We look at them and think that they're a wild animal. <laughs> they look like they're a very wild animal, but <laughs> they have <laughs> records uh, way Whoa. back to the <laughs> early Egyptians where they, they right. um, would raise these um, for... Uh, to catch rodents, um, and they're very, very good at it. They were <laughs> used during World War II to run... <laughs> hey, you get your fingernails stuck there. there. Um, <laughs> they would run fuse lines and stuff down through things uh, because they could get everywhere. And so they're, they're really used, to, or were used, in a lot of different ways. Now I think what we do is we see them primarily as pets. They do make very, very good pets. Um, they tend to live about five to seven years, and unfortunately, um, that type of, of ferret, aren't they? which is um, 
uh, is a little bit smaller than this type of ferret, but they're unfortunately uh, quite uh, known for getting uh, adrenal gland cancer. Right. So or lots of times which they, they don't live as long as the like other ferrets. Like a pancreatic ferrets. diabetes it, type. Yeah, of thing. it's a weird uh, it's a weird thing. Um, we've had several that have gone through operations, and, and they seem to, to do okay with them, but it is one of those things that another thing you want to take into consideration mm. if, you're, if you're considering uh, a yes. ferret for a pet. Yes, they can so. be in the vet's office a yeah. lot. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So. They're super smart, though. They are. Yeah, <laughs> they are, and unfortunately, um, that could be a good or a bad thing. Right. Because they are notorious <laughs> for getting into things. And I know several people that have them. As house pets, they can be litter box trained, and that's mm -hmm. not too much of an issue with them, except that they will get into everything else in your house. So you do have to kind of yeah, you take kept that baby proof. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep. You have to ferret proof your house. I think uh, if your cat can get there, probably yeah. this one. Yeah, <laughs> and I know several people that have them, and they get along quite well with their cats, too. So um, they, uh, they have a tendency to be really nice. I know that a lot of times when they're quite young, mm. they have a tendency to bite, just like a puppy or a kitten yeah, would. They can teething. chew on things, but because they have such sharp teeth, you do have to, to um, be careful of that when they're, when they're quite young. Now, North America has one native species of ferret. We do, yep. yeah. And the black-footed ferret. Black-footed ferret. And we talk about them and how uh, important they are in an ecosystem they are, because right. they are really, really important for um, uh, the controlling the population ecosystem. of things like uh, prairie dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and when we they breed lost like bunnies. the yeah, when we, we mm -hmm. when the population of black-footed ferrets went down, we had a big problem with an overpopulation mm -hmm. of these, uh, which isn't too much of a problem now because a lot of people shoot them, unfortunately. But um, but these black-footed mm -hmm. ferrets are endangered, not so much because of habitat loss, but because they're very susceptible to distemper. And oh. so what they're doing now is they're trapping a lot of these and vaccinating them for distemper and re-releasing them into the wild. It's so, a really good way to yeah. protect the ecosystem. It is. Yeah. So. <laughs> All righty, guys. <laughs> okay, let's get these guys back. <laughs> and we'll see who else we have here. Now, of course, when we're talking about carnivores, we're not just talking about mammals. We're talking about a lot of different things. There are bird carnivores, and there are, of course, reptile carnivores. And our next creature that we have today is a reptile carnivore. Oh. Okay. Now, I'm sure that there are people out there that can recognize this guy right here. This is an American alligator. Uh, his name's Walter. We've had Walter for a few years now. Um, he does not have his mouth taped shut. If we're doing programs, a lot of times we will tape his mouth shut. Uh, we just pre pretty much call that insurance. Sure. Uh, he's not uh, inclined to bite because he's handled so often. Um, right now he's a little bit cool, and of course we're talking about a cold-blooded animal, so <laughs> if he's cool, he's going to be fairly docile. If he were very, very warm, he'd be a lot more active than this, and if he were hungry, I probably wouldn't be holding him like this. Uh, oh, the only no. time I worry about, we have several alligators, and the only time I really worry about alligators is when um, we're feeding them. They can smell the food, and they turn from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. Yep, they tend to they really frenzy and yeah. turn into dino mode. Yeah, and if we can get a close-up of his face, you will notice his teeth right here. He has a lot of teeth, and they're very, very sharp teeth. Um, they are like sharks. They can continually um, like to grow new teeth in. So an alligator like this could live to be 60 years old and he might have 3,000 teeth in his entire lifetime. So once they lose a tooth, they get a new one in. Wow, like now, a conveyor belt. It is, but it's a little bit different than sharks. Sharks have kind of um, um, a, a layer it's of teeth that like will res fall down to, to this kind uh, of yeah, and it will fall into place. These ones have hollow teeth, and what will happen is it's like a Pez dispenser. Huh. One falls out, and another one will grow down. That's in really there. interesting. Yeah. And um, now yeah. these these pores here are these for are these almost like the ampullae of Lorenzini type deal? They are kind of. They can they can sense things with these, and of course, what you were talking about before is what sharks have, and it is a sensory organ. Um, there's a lot of really strange things about alligators. Alligators, mm. uh, again, are very, very important in their ecosystem because they are a carnivore. And we think of, of alligators as being really mean animals that are going to, you know, um, come up and lunge yeah. at you and eat you. And, and there are very, very few attacks on alligators. We're seeing more attacks by alligators these days, but it has nothing to do with them being more aggressive. It has to do with people, people feeding them. And going into yeah. their swimming holes. Yeah, exactly. We're seeing more people swimming with them. We're seeing more alligators. When I was a kid, alligators were endangered. 
and um, it was because of overhunting. So when they put them on the endangered species list, they started raising them as well. A lot of people in Florida, their livelihood was was uh, hunting alligators, mm -hmm. and then when they uh, when they outlawed hunting the alligators, um, these guys said, "What are we going to do for a living?" They started raising them, and then they would take a percentage of the babies and reintroduce them into the wild. Oh, that's and great. now, once again, and this has only been maybe 50 years, um, these alligators have come back to the point of once again being a nuisance animal. People have them in their backyards and they have them in their canals. And so it's become common practice for people to say, hey, I've got some table scraps, I'm gonna bring them down and throw them to the alligator. So now the alligator associates people with food. That's a bad thing. That's mm -hmm. one of the things we love to say, it's beautiful and wonderful to watch wildlife, but you don't wanna get it so close that it becomes a problem. So mm -hmm. that's why we don't think that that's a good idea to do so. Alligators have a couple of really neat things about them. If we look at him, we'll notice that he is very dark on his back. Yeah. But he's light on his belly. You can see how white his belly is here. Oh, so we're so seeing cool. this, and this is pretty common in a lot of aquatic animals, because what happens is if you happen to be something flying over a body of water and you look down, that body of water is dark. Mm -hmm. If you happen to be something swimming on the bottom and looking up, you're you seeing the see sky, the so it's light. And so a great way to camouflage would be to have a dark back and a light belly. That's what you see, see looking quite down. A bit. Yeah, we see this quite a bit with aquatic animals. <clears throat> you might also notice, and you can touch them there, you'll notice that these are very hard, armor. Uh, hard back. Yeah, it's an armor plating. And this serves two purposes. Mm -hmm. One is, especially when they're young, if something comes down and tries to grab them, they're going to have to get through armor plating. Good luck. Yep. It's pretty hard. The other thing is, if we look here, we can notice that each one of these little squares has a little ridge through it. Yeah. And it's called an osteoderm. And these osteoderms act as solar panels, oh. very much like uh, the Triceratops, um, ah, yes. Stegosaurus. The stegosaurus. Yeah. And Stegosaurus had these big, huge, bony plates, and they would absorb heat. Now, again, we're talking about a dark surface. Mm -hmm. So the sun comes down, and it heats up that dark surface. And these bony plates are porous, so the blood flows through them. And when it does, it heats up. So it acts kind of like a car radiator. That's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how he stays warm. Now, they, they sweat. They release heat to excess they heat can. by yeah. opening their jaws and just yeah. letting the heat Many, go. many reptiles will do this. And they'll just yeah, sit there. If they get too hot, um, they call this thermoregulating. So if they're too cold, they want to warm up. If they get too hot, they're going to want to cool down. And one of the ways they do that is to open their mouth like this. <laughs> now. Maybe we can get him to open his mouth so we can see and see. He's not going to let me no. do this. What? There we go. Walter, no. yep. No. Just watch the fingers there, buddy. Okay. If we see the open mouth, <laughs> we might see a couple of things. If we see that open mouth, we would notice that the tongue Very cannot light. stick mm -hmm. out of his mouth. Really good reason for this. If he sticks his tongue out of his mouth, it's going to last about a week before he bites it off. <laughs> so he doesn't want to do that. The other thing, which is again very, very important to him, he cannot open his throat and his mouth at the same time. Ah, so he can't and swallow food whole like a snake. Well, nope, but it's more important than that. He's an aquatic animal. He sits in an aquatic environment most of the time he's in the water. If he were to open his mouth and his throat at the same time, he would fill up with water and he could drown. So another reason that, uh, that he can't do that. I wish we could get him to open his mouth though. Mm -hmm. But let's mm -hmm. take a look at his eye here too. If you get a close-up of his eye, you might notice that he has two oh. eyelids. Now, if we open, let him open his eye here, we can see he's got, oops, did you see that? His eye, let's see if we can get him to do this again. Of course, now he's going to keep his eye closed, right? There we go. You'll see a kind of a cloudy membrane on his eye, and then it opens up like that. That is called a nictitating membrane. And what it does is it allows him to be able to close his eye and still see. Underwater, now, this is important right. for two reasons, and many carnivores have this. Things like cats will have this, frogs have this, quite a few animals have this nictitating membrane. It's a protective covering on the eye. He's going to be grabbing things that obviously don't want to get grabbed. They don't want to be eaten, so they're going to fight back, and they could turn around and scratch him in the eye. If they were to scratch his eye, it would be He's devastating done. for him. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Let's say they scratched this eye and he became blind in one eye. This whole side of his world now is gone to him. He's not going to be able to see 50% of the animals that might be around. He's not going to be able to see 50% of the predators that might want to eat him. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that he has good eyesight, and that's why he has that nictitating membrane.
Now, there's one other really cool thing about alligators, and sharks do this as well. When you take an alligator and you flip them on their back, an alligator does something very strange. He actually falls asleep. You're a magician. <laughs> Now, scientists wow. are a little bit confused on this. They don't know why they do this. I think it's kind of a pinched nerve situation. But sharks do this as well. And if you think about it, this is really wonderful if you happen to be a researcher. Because now what you can do is flip this animal anything over. To him, really. Yeah, anything. you can take your measurements and blood samples, anything else you need to take. He's going to just sit there and let you do it. Then you flip him back over again. He and wakes right up, <laughs> and off he goes ambling away. Crazy. <laughs> right. Now, they can also whip their tails. Yes, they have this big, long, flat tail. You'll notice when I'm holding him, I hold him kind of like a guitar it. here. <laughs> I hold him with one hand under his chin and one hand around him like this. If he decides to slap me, I can hold on to his tail with my, with my elbow. Um, and these osteoderms back here are quite sharp, if you could feel oh, those. Wow. Um, so if you get smacked with that, it's going to hurt. hurt. Yeah. But it's not really designed to smack things. It's designed as a paddle. This is primarily how he swims. He does have webbed feet. He's got a lot of webs on, on the toes on both front and back feet, but that is more for steering. He's going to use his tail to swim with, and these are very, very good swimmers. Now, one of the reasons they're so important in their ecosystem is because they dig ponds. And a large right. alligator is going to, uh, during the dry season in the Everglades, is going to dig a big, huge pond because he needs water. So that's why he's doing this. But what he's doing is providing water for all the other animals that live in that ecosystem. That's right. And occasionally a deer might come down and get eaten by an alligator, but that's the way of life. And the, what he's doing is, is providing this water source for all the other animals. And they did notice um, that it changed the ecosystem quite a bit when they lost the, the um, big populations of alligators in the Everglades. Now okay. they're back again and things are back to normal. All right. He also has a really cool head. If we look at the top yeah, of his head so here, neat. you will notice that he's got eyes on the top of his head. Big frog like yep. eyes. And nostrils on the top of his head. Mm -hmm. This, of course, means that he is going to sit there just like this and wait for something to walk by. If he's sitting in the water, the only thing that's going to be exposed above the water is going to be this right here. Everything else is down under the water. And you, if you're you walking along, are not going to see him. You're going to think he's just a big stick sitting in the water. And he's going to wait for you to get close. And then he lunges forward and grabs you, pulls you back in the water, and does and something called does the, death, the roll. death roll. Yes. And the death roll is very, very important for an alligator because although he's got very strong jaws and big, sharp, powerful teeth, we actually have a better jaw for taking bites out of Chew. something. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what happens with our teeth is they're very scissor-like, so we can take a bite out of something. If you have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you take a bite out of it, it's a nice U-shaped bite. If he bites a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, he's going to roll and throw peanut butter and jelly everywhere. It's not going to be a very efficient way for him to do that. But if he's going to eat something, he's going to tear pieces off of it, which sounds terrible, but it is quite an efficient way for him to wind up eating his food. And they can live to be 60 years old, and they oh, wow. will grow as long as they live, so they could be 15 feet long when they're full grown. Wow. Very nice animal. Dinosaur. Yeah, and they are truly dinosaur. Been around for a lot, a lot of years, so. Okay, so interesting. Let me get him back in here. <laughs> this is the reason we had to go um, back to get this one is because he's been very, very noisy today. And I'm sure that some of you will recognize this sound. So I think what I'll do before I take him out is I'll see if maybe I can get him to uh, make some noise and we'll see if anybody can tell me what he is. <laughs> Oh, I do see some hands out there in the audience. What do you think it is? He does sound like a parrot, and, and he is a bird, I will tell you that. I'm going to give you a hint, too. There's actually a song about him. He comes from Australia, and there's a song, and your hand went way up. He's a kookaburra. Very good, yes. I'm sure we're all familiar with a kookaburra sits in the old gum tree. Okay, come on out there, buddy. There we go. Okay. All right, this. Come here. There we go. This is a kookaburra. And if anybody looks at him and says, he looks awfully familiar to me, I can't quite place him. 
it's because he is the largest kingfisher in the world. So if we see kingfishers on the ponds and stuff when wow. you're fishing, um, he looks like a kingfisher. He's got the big long beak and, and the big head. Now, we, are, uh, we have a lot of different birds, and birds really kind of run the gamut as far as intelligence goes. Oh, yeah. There are very, very smart birds like crows and magpies yes. and parrots. And then, not so much. There's the derpy bird. He kind of falls into the not so much category. But that doesn't mean that he can't find his way around. He is an incredibly um, versatile animal when it comes to feeding. He does not even need to drink water. If we That's think about nice. where he comes from, he comes from Australia. Australia is the driest <laughs> continent in the world. These guys are used to dry climates. They can get all the moisture they need from what they eat. From your food. And they wind up eating a lot of different things. He will eat things like mice and um, other, birds. other birds. He will eat frogs and lizards and snakes anything. and bugs and <laughs> anything that moves, he will eat it. And I've seen him actually drop down and grab a little bug off the ground or something. They have really good eyesight mm -hmm. and, and they can Doesn't find a lot of things. Just yes, just I'm going to try and see if maybe we can get him to, to mm -hmm. so you can see him a little bit better. He is an extraordinary so creature. Cool. Um, his name, we call him Elvis. We call him Elvis because he's got this really cool hairdo and a wonderful singing voice. And I'm going to see if maybe we can get him to call. The way we do this is we go. And he will call. And the reason he's doing that is because he's saying to us, hey, let's go get something to eat. Okay, bye. <laughs> yeah, see, now he wants to take off. <laughs> oh, come here, you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have you do it, but we want to be quiet right now because we want him to, to calm down a little bit. So if you guys be quiet and we will, and you too, Zima. My goodness. Yeah, I know. We have everybody around here making noise. <laughs> um, but um, Elvis is calling to say, let's go get something to eat. There's also some other reason he's calling. He might be saying, stay out of my territory. There are a lot of these in Australia. They're all over the place, and they do tend to set up territories. They tend to stay in, in uh, small family groups of about 20 birds or so, and they're, they're um, um, extended family, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, things like that. Um, but they'll call to each other to say, let's go grab something to eat, usually in the morning and evening. Um, they tend to be kind of quiet because they're kind of resting in the, the heat of the day, um, but they will, um, morning and evening, make that call. Um, Okay, they are specifically from Australia too. We hear them in all the old. So they're not in ta Tasmania. Or well, you know, they've been introduced into some of these areas. They're not originally from that. Um, th I've heard that there is a small group of them in England, even because they've been really? introduced. But specifically, they're from Australia. And the reason that I say this is because Hollywood has taken great liberties with this bird. You hear them in all the old movies, all the old Tarzan films. Anytime Hollywood needs a, like, uh, an exotic like sounding monkey. birds, yeah. And they, of course, uh, <laughs> they do sound a, a little bit like they a monkey. Matter of fact, it. when I ask people, when they hear him, if they know what he is, lots of times we'll get people saying that they're a monkey. So um, you heard what I did. It's very easy to get him to call. And what I think I'm going to do is see if you guys can get him to call. So I'm going to go one, two, three, and I'm going to have you call to him and see if you can get him to call. Do you want to try that? Yeah. Okay. So here we go. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Well, I don't think you're quite loud enough. Let's try it again. One, two, three. Okay. Good now, one. these birds don't live as long as some other birds do, but they will live still about 20 years. They, they live that long. long. It's, it's pretty, it's good and long for a bird this, uh, much like this. They're bigger than I thought um, they would be. Yeah, and again, it has to do with the fact that they're the largest of the kingfishers. Right. Um, uh, right. Again, thinking and, uh, kingfishers, I'm thinking little right. guy with a huge head. Yep. And here's what's known as a laughing kookaburra. There are a number <laughs> of different types of kookaburra. And um, there are teal wing kookaburras and some other types of kookaburras, but he is the, the biggest of the big, so he, um, he's the largest of all of them. And really kind of an interesting bird altogether. You may have also noticed when he blinks his eyes, and I don't know if I can get him to do this, if you, if you watch him, membrane. he's also got that nictitating membrane too. So again, he's going to be eating things that don't want to get eaten, and they may wind up trying to lash out and scratch him, so he has that protection on his eye as well. Okay. Well, what do you think? You want to go back? Yeah, I think we'll put him back too. And we have another of our carnivores today. So we'll get him back in here. Now this one, 
is something that we would probably consider your classic carnivore. We hear a lot about carnivores, and this is one that you might think of as being a carnivore, whereas you might not think of a kookaburra being a carnivore. You would think of this as being a carnivore. Yep, you got it. Okay. Okay. And this is Pepper. And Pepper is a gray fox. Now, unfortunately, she's a little bit shy. But we'll look at her for a second and see that she does have quite a bit of red on her. And so many people think that, um, that she would be a red fox. And if we had our red fox with us today, you would easily be able to tell the difference. Can you tell me some of the differences of red foxes? I can. Uh, they're quite a bit taller. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the white tip on the end of their tail, and you can see that she doesn't. She's, she's mostly a sable mix of grays, browns, blacks, and the orange on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, red foxes also will be all red all over or sometimes have the black socks. That's yep. about it. Yeah, there's quite a few. <laughs> and there's a lot of reasons for these differences as well. Red foxes are, are not closely related to gray foxes either. Gray foxes, hi, what are you doing? Gray foxes um, are a lot more cat-like to me. They are canids, but they are a lot more cat-like in, their, in their, the way they move and uh, just their disposition. And we always try and socialize our animals so that they're used to people. And when we got her, we got her at about six weeks old. Aww. And we had her living in our house for a little while just to get her used to people and used to all of those things that are associated with people. And of course, some of those things are dogs. And we do have three dogs at home. One is a basset hound. Oh, and no. yes, and so it was quite funny that we had this play between the fox and the hound. And, the hound, yes. and uh, <laughs> what would happen is she would play, and she loved to play. Mm -hmm. So she would run up behind the basset hound and bite her on the tail and turn around and run. <laughs> and of course, the basset hound would turn around and chase her, but the basset hound is much slower than she is. And so she'd go and run underneath the couch. <laughs> well, by the time the basset hound was there, she would have gone around the backside of the couch. <laughs> and come around and the Bassett's got her head underneath the couch and she would come up and bite her in the tail again and turn around and run. So she played this game I with the Basset Hound, girl. but the Basset Hound got <laughs> sick of it very, very soon and would come um, whining to us and say, Rick, can you put the fox away? Yeah. She's driving me crazy. But she did a lot of the same things that cats like to do. She would sit up on the windowsill and look out the window like a cat they, would. They chirp quite a bit, do they not? They do, and they have, um, you'll, you'll notice that she is quite short. Um, she doesn't have the, the height that a red fox would have. Mm -hmm. Now think about the habitat that we see these animals in. A red fox mm -hmm. likes the open field habitat. <coughs> and mm -hmm. of course the, the um, height it gives them an advantage because yeah, they can look the up and over the grasses, exactly. Mm -hmm. She is a climber. Many times yes. these will be up in trees. trees. And lots of people think that we don't see as many foxes as we see, um, or, or gray foxes as we see red foxes. And uh, so they think that there aren't that many around. We have as many um, uh, gray foxes as red foxes. But because they come from woodland habitat, you, if you look into the woods, it's much harder to look a distance into the woods. If you have a red fox in a field, especially with a big oh, white you tail, can see them. you can see them for three quarters mm -hmm. of a mile. So that's why we see more red foxes than gray foxes. And because they climb trees, a lot of their food is things like birds and chipmunks and squirrels. They do eat rabbits, so they do have that. Um, and, and again, we're talking about them being a carnivore. And they do have very sharp, very, very good carnivore teeth. Uh, the, those canine teeth are, are for, for grabbing and, and um, killing those animals. But r foxes and gray, gray and red foxes, during the fall, late summer and fall, they, their diet changes and they become a little more omnivorous. So they're going to eat things like um, fruits if they find berries and, and fruits and, and even some leaves and, and stuff. They something. will eat those, yes, yeah, seeds and things. Um, but of course, you get into the wintertime and that stuff just isn't available and they go right back to being carnivores again. So she now would can be. Now, do the gray foxes uh, also use their ears to track small rodents under I've the snow? I've not seen them do that, but I'm, I'm sure the they reds? have. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do have the ability. And so you're talking about red foxes mm -hmm. being able to hear. Things and like we've all seen it. They do that bounce face first into the snow. Yeah, vertical. And, and it's just amazing to me that a red fox can hear um, a, a mouse walking under a foot like of snow, of and and to be able to pinpoint it to the point where they can jump up in the air and come down and grab that animal under the snow. Amazing. It is amazing, amazing. and it's, it's cool to see that behavior too. Coyotes will do that as well, but foxes oh, yeah, are, are yeah, notorious right, for, do. for doing that. Yeah.
Um, um, now the gray fox is also called the tree fox because they can they climb do, trees. They do, yeah, and they, they um, we'll see them in trees. They're also very, very widespread um, throughout the United States and down all the way into Venezuela. Oh, wow. So we see them in a lot of different places and a lot of different habitats. We've seen them in rainforest habitat and we see them in, in desert habitat. So they're, uh, they're pretty, um, pretty good at surviving in all kinds of different, uh, uh, different situations. Um, mm. I've seen photographs of gray foxes with fawn deer up in the trees. They've gotten them. They've brought them up into the tree. It's that's almost like, amazing. you know, like it, it is cat. amazing. <laughs> it's, you know, the, I liken it to seeing a leopard with a, you know, right, with a, right, um, antelope, the antelope or something up, up in the tree. tree. Yep, <laughs> but they will do that. So, and see what she's doing now. She's kind of sniffing she's around sniffing trying everything. to find something. She is in her winter coat right now. Oh, I feel fluffy. She's very, very nice and she's got a beautiful coat. You'll also notice that she has a black stripe down her tail. It's another way we yeah. can tell that she is a gray fox. Oh. Um, but, um, uh, of course, the red fox has the tip on the tail. Mm -hmm. But when she sheds out in the spring, she really kind of blows her coat out. And in two weeks, she can go from looking like this to looking like she's got the mange. Like mange. It, it really is amazing to see how much of their coat they do get rid of. Uh, and then, of course, you know, all summer long, she's growing it back so that she'll have a nice winter coat again. Um, she can handle all kinds of, of um, cold weather. Um, she is outside in an outside enclosure along with our other fox and, and um, our fisher and several of our other animals that are, that are um, winter animals. And even this really, really cold weather we've had doesn't bother them in the, in the least. That's amazing. <laughs> you look like you want to <laughs> jump down there. Now, yeah. uh, fox, baby foxes are not puppies. They're they call called them, kits. Yeah, they call them kits, yep. And this particular fox has the longest uh, gestation period. Oh, that Is I did not? not know, but you, yeah. No. It's about 110 to 120 days. Yeah, yeah. Probably makes sense because, again, they have to get through a, a full winter season before they, um, before they would go ahead and have their kits. This makes sense. Um, and they will have their kits. They're not as much of a digging animal as the red foxes are. They will dig. But they're not as um, as inclined to have their uh, have a burrow. They might live in um, a brush pile or something and have their kits in a brush pile. Um, the advantage, of course, to going underground is that it's a little bit easier to protect your kits and your. Right. Uh, you There's know, really only one so, entrance for right. the exit. Yeah. So and red foxes <coughs> will generally do that, but uh, but these aren't as inclined to be digging animals. But they do have semi-retractable claws, very much like a cat. Oh, really? So they can climb trees very easily. Um, and like I said, she'll go up there and, and eat birds. She'll hmm. get into bird nests and eat those. Um, Eggs, and and uh, you know, you, you generally aren't going to see red foxes and gray foxes in the same area because they do hunt for the same food and stuff. So they tend to be um, a little bit uh, um, more uh, regional. Depending yeah, on yeah. They they don't want to be together as much. Uh, but um, all mm. right. Okay. She's really cool. Well, she is just a wonderful <laughs> animal, and obviously what we would consider uh, a true carnivore. Some of these other animals we wouldn't think of as being carnivores. This is but we're talking about foxes <laughs> and wolves and those mm -hmm. types of things. We think of those as being um, the carnivores. So she is indeed a true carnivore, yeah. and, uh, and she's kind of a favorite of ours. We've had her for a long time. Um, and you'll notice that I'm not trying to pet her up by the face mm -hmm. or anything like that. She does have a tendency to be somewhat nippy when she's, you know, out in, in a group like this. And one of the things we like to make sure that people know is that she's not a pet. She looks like she would be. She looks like you could walk down the street with her. But again, the only animal that we've had so far that would be a really good pet would be those ferrets because they mm -hmm. are domestic animals. She is not a domestic animal and she has bitten me before very hard. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just because you have to kind of assume that um, th this is an animal that, that has the, those wild animal tendencies and we just want to make sure that, that we respect them for that. And, and, right. uh, you know, no so. matter how much rapport or bond you think you have with your wild pet, it's still a wild animal. That's right, absolutely. So, all right. Well, she is our last animal that we have for the carnivores today. And, and um, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to thank you once again for having us here. And well, thank you so much for bringing the carnivores in. Hope you got a chance to in. see some, some good carnivores, and we're going to move on to another episode with herbivores next time. Sounds great. Uh, join us then for another episode of Creature Teachers with Rick Roth. My name is Talia, and we will see you then.